I'm Kim Shepley. I'm the director of Princeton's program in law and public affairs. If I'm booming at you, I think I hear a little bit of an echo. This is, this is a challenging room acoustically, so we've got to just get the microphone right. Um, and uh, the Princeton program in law and public affairs um, is doing a series of events uh, this semester in which we're dealing with questions uh, pertaining to um, the war on terror. Uh, so as many of you saw outside uh, next uh, Tuesday night, we have Bart Gelman, who's the author of Angler, the book on Dick Cheney, uh, coming to talk about his book. There is, in fact, a poster, and there are flyers um, outside. That will be next Tuesday. The following um, uh, Wednesday, uh, which is uh, March 10th, we're going to have a panel discussion of whether Bush administration officials should be investigated and or prosecuted for things that happened during their time on watch with people with a wide variety of different views on the panel. Um, and then we'll be having uh, later in uh, April one of our big lectures, the Bernstein Lecture, uh, we'll featuring it on April 16th, I believe it is, um, the Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, Justice Dorit Banish, who will be talking to us about fighting terrorism uh, and human rights. So we have a whole series of events this semester uh, that I think if you like this, you'll love the whole series, and we hope to see you at, at future LAPA events. But let me start by introducing our speaker tonight. Everyone in the room will remember where they were when 9-11 happened. And for most of us, the shock of the attack eventually faded, and most of us have gone back to our normal lives. For some Americans, the families of 9-11 the members of the American military who have gone off to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq, the members of the intelligence community who have tried to keep the U.S. safe. For them, 9-11 changed everything. Of course, 9-11 had many effects around the world, not just for those in Al-Qaeda and associated groups, but also for those who were swept up in the drift net of suspicion that was cast through the Muslim world. Early on after 9-11, the United States made a fateful decision to capture suspected terrorists and to put them in a place beyond law, a place where no court could reach them and a place where suspects could be held indefinitely without legal process. The U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, became what one of Britain's highest judges, Lord Stein, called a legal black hole. Opened at the start of 2002, Guantanamo had nearly 600 detainees housed there, by the summer of that year. Ultimately, about 800 men were to be held in the detention facility at some point, and at the moment, there are about 245 still remaining in Guantanamo. U.S. and international lawyers have fought for years to establish that the men held at Guantanamo have rights. Rights to counsel, rights to be held only upon the showing of some evidence that they'd done something, rights not to be tortured. The lawyers who have taken on Guantanamo detainees have come from many high-powered law firms, from human rights groups, from small legal practices. They have fought against long odds to get U.S. courts to recognize their claims. Finally, in a trio of Supreme Court decisions, Rasul, Hamdan, and Boumediene are the names of these cases, they established that the detainees at Guantanamo have the right to challenge their detention. We are really lucky to have with us tonight one of the key lawyers in this effort, someone for whom 9-11 changed his life in many ways. Now, this is a man, David Reams, our speaker tonight, who didn't intend to have 9-11 actually change his whole life. At the time 9-11 happened, David Reams was a partner in the prestigious law firm of Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. And David Reams uh, had been working primarily on, on uh, appellate litigation, uh, corporate law. He had filed a number of amicus briefs in, in, um, in the Supreme Court and other appellate courts on civil liberties matters, a sign of what was to come. But in many ways, David Reams represented the kind of lawyer who practices at the top of America's very top law firms, someone who handles the litigation, and the, uh, the legal concerns primarily of the corporate world with dignity and with grace. It turns out that David Reams' law firm was approached, uh, as many law firms were approached in the days after 9-11, to see if they would be willing to handle some of the cases of Guantanamo detainees. And his firm said, we'll take one or two. They were given 13 cases, um, mostly of Yemeni detainees. 
Uh, and David Reams, as one of the senior partners at Covington, decided to get involved to make sure that his firm had some say in how it was these cases were handled. Well, as they say in this business, the rest is history. David Reams got very involved in these cases. Um, they became his life passion, as he'll tell you. Once he started going to Guantanamo, once he actually met the people he refuses to call the detainees, he calls them just the men, he realized that there were a lot of stories behind the folks who got round up and put in Guantanamo. He also realized that a lot of the things that he had done in his legal career to date meant advocating rights, advocating rights for people for whom the fact that they had rights was not exactly an issue. Here, the legal issues were much more basic. Did the men whose lives were in his hands have rights to challenge their detention at all? And so, among the things that David Reams has done is he's gotten very involved in these Guantanamo cases. And last summer, he did what for many lawyers would be really quite unthinkable. And for many of the students here who want to go to law school, you'll learn eventually how unthinkable this thing is. He, he gave up a senior partnership at Covington and Burling to start his own nonprofit human rights litigation firm called Appeal for Justice. He decided that the things that he had been working on were too important to do part-time and were too important uh, not, for, not to do uh, as well as he could. And so he's since last summer been devoting full-time to the Guantanamo cases and full-time to human rights litigation. Um, David Reams is uh, someone who had come to this practice from uh, an, an honorable uh, career, a very promising start. He went to Columbia College, got his law degree from Harvard. He started at Covington and Burling in 1983. He handled a lot of important cases, but it wasn't until he got to Guantanamo that he realized, I think, in many ways, the tremendous importance of being a lawyer in these difficult times. And so we're very, very lucky and fortunate to have with us David Reams, who's going to talk to us tonight about the challenge of closing Guantanamo, experiences and reflections of a Guantanamo habeas lawyer. David Reams. Good evening. Thank you for coming to hear me talk about my experiences. I uh, always wanted to go to Princeton, and now here I am. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's telling in, in line with what Kim was saying that when 9-11 happened, uh, I remember it very clearly, I was on the phone with a client arguing over fees. And, <laughs> and I'm now a member of the Guantanamo Bay Defense Bar Association. Uh, I want to try to read this. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I want to thank Kim for organizing it. Uh, her dedicated staff and her able staff really pulled it together and uh, want to thank Princeton for uh, arranging this and hosting it as well. As Kim said, I used to be in a, in a corporate law firm and I left over the summer after this work sort of took me over. I was saying before that it wasn't a question of I got to this point in time and it was either road A or road B and I chose road B. I really had no choice by the time I got there because what I was doing had become all-consuming and I would really lost interest in anything else in the law. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, our experiences. When I say our experiences, I mean the experiences of the lawyers who became lawyers for the Guantanamo uh, detainees. And I'm not authorized to speak for any of them. I don't speak for any of them. I do think my experience is representative, and I do think that I reflect their, uh, the consensus views, but again, uh, I'm just giving you my impression of what the consensus views are. Guantanamo was much in the news last summer as a result of the decision in the Boumediene case when the Supreme Court held that the men had a constitutional right to challenge their detention. Shall I? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, and so it was much in the news, and then the presidential. Okay. I just want to make everybody happy. Uh, <laughs> then, then uh, the presidential election heated up, 
and the economy tanked and Guantanamo faded from the news. Then, as you know, Obama took office. And one of his first acts in office was to declare that he closed Guantanamo. And Guantanamo got back in the news. Just this morning, the newspapers carried a few stories that were pretty relevant here. There was a report of an interview with Eric Holder, the Attorney General, one of my former partners at Covington, saying that he thought it would take a year to go through the files of the men to decide who the administration thought should be kept or held. Obama, of course, gave himself a year to close Guantanamo, and even then, he didn't say that the men would be free. He said that when Guantanamo was closed, the men who wouldn't be freed would be sent to some other prison. I'll talk a little bit later about uh, my own impatience with the pace of events uh, by the administration and some of the considerations that are holding them back. But uh, now I want to talk about Guantanamo and the men who are there because most Everybody thinks of this in abstract terms. Should the prison be closed? What should we do with the men? But we, the habeas lawyers, are really the only people in uh, private life who have ever met the men. There are about 200 of us who have been down to Guantanamo, who have met the men, gotten to know them as individuals, and gotten a, gotten a feel of them as actual human beings and not an abstract mass, which is the way most people consider them, uh, whatever your views of them. Um, and, and those views have really colored a lot of the debate, the misunderstandings and the misimpressions. I'll start with a brief bit of background just to, just to sort of catch us up on how we even got to the beginning of the legal process. The men at Guantanamo consist primarily of prisoners who were either apprehended in Afghanistan or were apprehended after they had crossed the border into Pakistan from Afghanistan. And the reason that they tend to be overwhelmingly Arab is that the Arabs who were there were associated with the Taliban by the Northern Alliance that was coming to overthrow the Taliban and the Arabs were in fear for their lives once the Northern Alliance had taken over uh, and, and deposed the uh, Taliban. So that is, that's the reason for the flight from uh, Afghanistan. They had come to Afghanistan, again I'm speaking generically, they'd come to Afghanistan in the late 1990s or earlier for many different reasons. Some of them came be because they regarded the Taliban as the pure religious state. Some of them came because, I mean, they, they regarded Afghanistan under the Taliban as the pure religious state. And they saw an opportunity to spread Islam among the people of Afghanistan. Some men came in order to support the Taliban in its battle with the Northern Alliance. Some men came for greater economic opportunity because compared to Yemen, for example, which is where my clients are from in one of the poorest countries in the world, Afghanistan is even poorer uh, and uh, just as Americans might go to Canada or Mexico for cheap drugs, there were people, and my, some of my clients are among them, who were going to Afghanistan uh, for that purpose. Uh, some of them were going just for a new start in life, and there were just many reasons why people would be in Afghanistan. It's sort of a bias or a stereotype that if an Arab was in Afghanistan in the late 90s or early 2000s, he had to have been there for no good reason. I just ask you to think about whether that could be a fair way of looking at it. Just from the missionary standpoint, for example, many men went to Afghanistan to spread Islam. 
well, there are 60,000 Mormon missionaries all over the world. There are 20,000 Catholic missionaries, if I'm correct, and nobody thinks they're up to no good simply because they're Catholics or Mormons teaching their religion in other countries. But somehow, if a Muslim's in Afghanistan, uh, it has to be for perfidious reasons. So how were they captured? Only 5% of the prisoners at Guantanamo were seized by American forces. The rest were apprehended by Afghanis in Afghanistan, and again, I'm making broad generalizations here, or they were apprehended by Pakistani border guards as the men left Afghanistan and went into Pakistan. At the time, the U.S. was airdropping thousands of leaflets across Afghanistan offering bounties starting at $5,000 a head, a huge amount in a country where the per capita income is south of $200, uh, to turn over members of the Taliban or al-Qaeda. Rumsfeld boasted that at the time, uh, boasted at the time that he had leaflets offering these bounties dropping like snowflakes to incentivize a large number of people to begin crawling through those tunnels and caves looking for the bad folks. Uh, beyond this enticing financial uh, uh, incentive, turning a fellow Afghani over to the U.S. was a neat way of settling a score with a personal enemy, his family, his tribe, or, or, release or, or, or eliminating a political opponent. I'm not suggesting that none of the men who were seized in Afghanistan were uh, supporters of the Taliban or al-Qaeda. That's something that the cases will thrash out that I'm working on in the course of deciding whether the U.S. has any justification for holding them. But I want to make the point that the men, when apprehended, were like fish caught in a net. It was dragnet. And now they're at Guantanamo. Most of the evidence against them has been developed post hoc, and I'll talk a little bit about the evidence in a second. But just to take the long view, you didn't have Americans in Afghanistan watching what the men were doing. The evidence against the men consists primarily of government prepared summaries of the men's own interrogations and reports of what other detainees said about the men. So you can imagine how different it is from a case in which you have an eyewitness saying I mean, a credible or reliable eyewitness, in my opinion, saying, I saw this man here doing X, Y, or Z. The first prisoners started arriving at Guantanamo in January 2002. It took uh, two and a half years for the Supreme Court to hold that they had a right to challenge their detentions, and that was June 2004. And in between those two points, the only people they saw were members of the military or intelligence services and members of the International Committee on the Red Cross who aren't allowed to talk about what they see or hear there because that's the condition, the confidentiality that enables them to bring abuses to the attention of the governments. So we were the first people that they saw and as a result of seeing them, we saw these men, we got to know these men as individuals, we got to understand their humanity, their uh, their personal stories, and we also came back with these horrific reports of abuse that had been concealed from the world because the military completely controlled the access to Guantanamo. And as I was saying earlier at dinner, up until the time that we began going, the military had the, or the government had this absolute block on the narrative of who the men were, what they had done, because the government controlled all of the outflow of information. When we got down there, we had a completely different uh, uh, appreciation of what had happened and was going on there. And we began to challenge the government's narrative. And we began to shine a light on Guantanamo, which just drove the government nuts, because it had had a monopoly up to that point. 
We also allowed information from the outside to come into the prisoners whose reality had been completely controlled up until that time by the government. They heard only what the government wanted to tell them, and the government, in its own uh, theory of interrogation and intelligence gathering, basically left them in a position where they didn't know what was real and what was unreal and which was up and which was down and who you could believe and who you couldn't believe. So we, we came back with a far more sympathetic impression of the men than most Americans have been treated to and a much harsher view of conditions at Guantanamo than uh, the government acknowledged. The evidence, as I've indicated, was sort of shabby, and I'll develop that later, but suffice it to say for a moment that 27 cases have gone to judgment. In 23 of the cases, the men have been determined not to be enemy combatants, even under the government's broad definition of the term. Well, seeing the human condition of the men, getting to know them as individuals, turned these cases from uh, questions of legal justice into questions of human justice. We weren't just concerned with did the men get due process, was there judicial review, uh, and, and uh, what could the government do to captives. These are all sort of abstract questions, but we got to know the men. Here's what many Americans, or most Americans, came to believe. I'd just like to read you some quotes here very briefly. To many Americans, the men at Guantanamo are scarcely human, and I think that persists to this day. They're the quintessential other, faceless, frightening, unknowable, implacably hostile. They're devils, they're fiends, they're a satanic brotherhood. And many Americans still think of the men as Rumsfeld and Cheney first portrayed. Rumsfeld said they were among the most dangerous, best trained, vicious killers on the face of the earth. Cheney said they were the worst of a very bad lot. They are very dangerous. They are devoted to killing millions of Americans, innocent Americans if they can, and they are perfectly prepared to die in the effort. And this one's my favorite. General Richard Myers, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, described them as, quote, the sort of people who would chew through a hydraulics cable to bring a C-17 transport plane down, unquote. An officer at Guantanamo who was in charge of the habeas lawyers uh, once told me, American to American, man to man, these uh, clients of yours would slit your throat in a second if they had a chance. So the first thing I want to point out is that we have come to view them as an undifferentiated mass of um, brown-skinned, bearded evildoers with skull caps and robes who speak a strange language, worship a strange god, and in Bush's immortal words, hate our freedom. But the men obviously have much more in common than their religion and their language and the cultural heritage of the world, of, of the countries that they come from. The point I'm stressing here is their individuality and their humanity and the terrible, the terrible uh, well that America and Americans fell into when it began to treat these men as an undifferentiated mass, making generalizations about them as they. They were these vicious rats. They were these vicious killers. And so much of it had a racial uh, and religious connotation. And I, I think that that's one of the most shameful things about this from our standpoint, apart from our brutal treatment of them. We've gotten to know their families. I've been to Yemen seven times. Uh, it's not a place I'd recommend for a vacation. And I'm going for an eighth time in April. We've seen the wives who haven't been with their husbands for seven years, the children who haven't been with their fathers for seven years, in some cases children who have never even seen their fathers, sisters, friends, 
aunts, uncles, the whole thing. Imagine being kept from your family, kept from your relatives for seven years without any meaningful communication, obviously no visits. Letters are sometimes delivered, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're heavily censored. Even, and this is a famous example, a seven-year-old girl wrote to her father and the letter appeared half blacked out by the military censors. What could they possibly have been thinking? So together with the deep injustice of their imprisonment and the suffering our government inflicted on them, these cases moved for us from being a quest for justice in the legal sense to being a quest for justice in the human sense. Now I want to turn very briefly to the conditions of the confinement of these men. Guantanamo is divided into seven or eight, actually, uh, camps. Camp one has been for the force-fed hunger strikers, of whom there are now probably 45. Camp two is largely empty Sometimes I get two and three mixed up, but let's say camp two is empty. Camp three is reserved for the prisoners who are regarded as the prison leadership of the men. Uh, not outside leaders, but basically the people the men listen to and, and uh, follow for advice. Camp four is the um, club med camps. It's uh, reserved for the most compliant and cooperative clients. I don't mean uh, men. I don't mean those who have ratted out their fellows, but those who are basically the easiest for the guards to cope with. And that's their reward. And I now have about five clients in Camp 4, thanks, thank God. Camps 5 and 6 are solitary confinement uh, camps which the, uh, full, full, of, full of solitary confinement cells, which the government is pleased to call single occupancy cells. It's true. And in these, in these two uh, camps, which are somewhere between, I'd say, maximum security federal prisons and edging up to supermax like Musawi is in, each man is in a tiny cell uh, four concrete walls, no sunlight, no natural light, uh, uh, an, an iron, a brown iron door, rust-colored door, with a little slit down the left side so the guards can see in, and a little slit at about waist height so that the food tray can be put in. And the only way that the men can communicate with each other while they're in their cells is by shouting through the food slot or one of my clients told me shouting through the drain pipes uh, which, which has some effectiveness but not a lot um, and then when they pass them each other on the way to wreck or back from wreck they can talk to each other briefly but for 20, 22, 23 hours a day they are all by themselves. I will uh, say that there may have been some improvements in that regard as a result of an investigation that Obama ordered be conducted at Guantanamo. There may be a bit more socialization, but for most of the prisoners, it's 22, 23 hours a day in this solitary cell. One of the things they complain about is the light, is this glaring fluorescent light, three bulbs with these white or beige walls. And they say that it makes them blind, that you can see the light even when you close your eyes. And I'm not saying this to be dramatic. I'm saying it because it's true. Inside the cells, all there is is a metal sink and toilet, which are conjoined, and a platform like this that, that, that comes up from the floor. It's not a shelf so much as a raised surface that and it's concrete or metal that the men can sleep on they're given these isotherm mats the men who are behaving themselves get to have a prayer rug 
They get to have uh, uh, prayer beads. They have Qurans for the most part if they want them. They're given books sometimes. We tried to get in Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella, but those were rejected uh, at a time when they didn't want the men exposed to the English language. And they still really don't. Uh, they, they now allow them to see two-week-old copies of Al Haram, which is a government newspaper in Cairo, which has little interest to the uh, Yemenis, for example, or the Afghans, the Afghanis, or the Pakistanis. So this is the life of the men in Camps 5 and Camp 6. We believe that it violates international law to keep men in solitary confinement on a perpetual basis, and it's driving some of the men crazy. My understanding is they've moved the hunger strikers uh, into Camp 5 or Camp 6 in order to isolate them because Camp 1 was too social an environment. That moves us on to the force feeding. There is a debate uh, about whether or not force feeding in the case of a competent prisoner is permissible as a matter of law. The ICRC says that it's not. Other groups say that it's not. Then there are other groups who say, well, you know, these guys can't just be allowed to die. They should be kept alive. But if you're going to do that, you should at least do it humanely. Well, force feeding at Guantanamo is anything but humane. Men are fed by a, a tube being inserted in the nose, goes down the back of the throat, and into the stomach. Uh, the men are not given anesthetic. They're not given throat lozenges. And the administration of the force feeding is quite brutal. Guards will yank it out. Guards will shove it in. In the early days, we had stories from our clients of tubes being used from one prisoner to another without sanitation in between. And then the men are required to be in restraint chairs, which you may have seen. I think the New York Times ran photos of them a couple of years ago. These are like the chairs that you see uh, in old movies that were used for electric chairs. The men are uh, bound. All of their limbs are bound to the, to, the, to, the, to the arms and the legs of the chair. Their heads are held back by another restraint. Their mouths are covered by another restraint. So they literally can't move in any possible way. And then the tube goes in. And it may be left in for two or three hours. There are a couple of men who have been on hunger strikes for maybe three years. The most recent wave of hunger strikes was precipitated uh, by a worsening of conditions at Guantanamo. You'd think at the, toward the end of the Bush administration, things might have let up. And when Obama came in, they'd get a lot better. But it actually hasn't happened, according to the clients and in our experience. They started going on, hunger, on this hunger strike in, uh, in November around Thanksgiving just because of conditions. And then when Salim Hamdan was freed from Guantanamo and returned to Yemen, which happened in December, they went nuts. Because here was a guy who had been charged with aiding terrorism, who had been convicted of aiding terrorism, who had served time for aiding terrorism, and then he went back home. And within a couple of weeks, he was a free man. While these guys at Guantanamo had been held there for seven years without charges, without trial, and they were still there. The sense of unfairness was just uh, excruciating, and one of the responses was the hunger strike. So the things that concern us at the moment most, I think, are the solitary confinement and the method of hunger striking tube feeding, which regardless of what you think of the ethics of tube feeding, we think that the tube feeding is being administered at the prison as a form of torture itself to punish men for engaging in hunger strikes and to discourage men from engaging in hunger strikes. Now the cases. The cases that we brought are called habeas corpus cases. And, 
and, and for anyone who doesn't really have any legal training. Habeas corpus cases are an ancient form of lawsuit. Habeas corpus literally means hand over the body. And it's a form of legal action that goes back to the Magna Carta. Uh, and it was a form of action that developed, really, I think, to protect the nobles at the time, to protect them against arbitrary imprisonment by the crown. It, it, it allowed them to go into court and demand that the king justify his imprisonment of you. And the government, the, the crown would then have to come in and justify in law or fact or both why you were there. And this has been such a bedrock principle of uh, Anglo-American law that it's written into the Constitution. The Constitution says that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in time of invasion or rebellion. And that certainly doesn't apply in the case of the men at Guantanamo. So we brought these actions. The government stonewalled us in the litigation for a couple of years. The first lawsuits were brought in February 2002, and it wasn't until 2004 that the Supreme Court held that the cases could go forward, and then we spent a couple of years while the cases were stayed and Congress came in and stripped the courts of jurisdiction because that was the way to undo the court actions. And then we finally prevailed this, uh, this summer, and now the cases are moving forward. This, this turns us sort of to what the government has filed and what it's doing and what it's saying. In the habeas corpus case, we file our petition saying our client is unlawfully held, government come forward and justify the detention or release the man. What the government then files in response is called a return, sort of, sort of analogous to what you'd file in an answer to a civil complaint, except this is supposed to include the government's evidence. But the government's file, the returns it's filed in our cases, starts with a narrative, which is basically its story of uh, who the prisoner is and what he's done. And then the last line is, and therefore, we're justified in holding him as an enemy combatant. So it's a series of factual allegations. To support the factual allegations, the government appends a set of exhibits, you know, sometimes as many as 38, 39, 50 exhibits, uh, which it relies upon the way a thesis would, re would rely upon the sources in, a, in uh, 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 a doctoral student, I mean, would rely on the sources in a thesis through footnotes and the like. These are the government's evidence. This is the supposed support for its allegations. As I indicated before, the two principal forms of evidence are government prepared reports of interrogations of the petitioner, I'll call them to avoid confusion. The petitioner is my client. And government prepared reports of statements by other prisoners who say, I saw petitioner at an al-Qaeda training camp, or I saw petitioner on the front lines, or something to the effect. It's the incriminating stuff. Then there's also uh, evidence that the government uses, which consists of what I would call mysterious lists. Uh, these are uh, in CIA evidence, and I'm not revealing anything that's classified or anything like that, but it basically is purported to be a list, say, of 324 Arabs, which was found on the computer hard drive in a computer in an al-Qaeda safe house in Karachi, and the whole list is blacked out, except for the name of our client. The CIA just says, this is the list, this is how we got it, there, this is where it's from, and his name's on it, and that supports our conclusion that he's al-Qaeda. And we're struggling with the government to get original copies of this list to check their authenticity and what they really purport to be. One theory is that they're simply lists of men who were being held in Pakistani prisons who had fled from Afghanistan. 
Well, that doesn't prove anything. But the point is we don't know what these lists are. We don't know where they came from. We don't know whether they were manufactured after the fact. Then, um, so those are basically the three forms of evidence. Very little physical evidence. It's all what the client said or what the client's reported to have said in this summary prepared by the government and what an accuser has said. With respect to the client's own statements, you've got this terrible problem of translation, first of all. You've got a situation in which, you know, it's not like an FBI agent asks me, where are you on the night of April 3rd, 2008? It's a situation in which the prisoners on one side, the uh, military or CIA or Justice Department guys on the other side, and then there's a translator, and the interrogator asks a question in English. It gets translated into Arabic. The answer is given, into Arab, given in Arabic and then translated back into English. And there are so many, there's so much room for slips between cup and lip there, especially in the stressful circumstances under which the interrogations are being conducted, especially uh, considering that, as I also said at dinner tonight, the uh, translators were not all UN trained translators. Some of them were high school students of Arabic who were taken because the demand for Arabic translators is so fierce. So I'm going to just make the point without giving a lot of detailed examples that there are very egregious errors, literal errors, where uh, might have been was translated as was or did, uh, where away is translated as toward, where terms that have a, a uh, sinister connotation in English are translated to an Arab who has no idea of the connotation of the word and who answers it as though it were an innocent connotation, where in fact it's a sinister connotation. So you have all these problems. There usually isn't any real argument about the underlying facts before the man went to Pakistan or Afghanistan. And to use the archetypal Yemen example, he was born in Taiz in October 1984. He, his father was uh, an engineer. He went to school, high school, uh, avoided military service, either by going to university or by bribing his way out or getting a student deferment. He went to mosque, he played soccer, and then he went to Pakistan, and then he went to Afghanistan. And then the question becomes, why did he, uh, what did he do when he was there, and why did he really go? And that's where this very uh, gauzy, unreliable evidence comes into play. So we're fighting, we're fighting to get the original transcripts of the interrogations. We would like to see the recording of the interrogation so we can assess whether the transcript was reliable, I mean whether the report of the interrogation was reliable, and then you have the fact that the summary of the report was prepared in some cases two or three weeks after the interrogation took place, and you don't even know whether the report was, was prepared by the guy who conducted the interrogation. Now I may be sounding too much like a lawyer and I apologize for that, uh, but I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple of examples that go beyond this kind of evidence. Oh, and I, I should interrupt myself to say that much of the evidence from accusers are from accusers who are notorious liars. And I'm not just saying that because it's self-serving. There's a long Washington Post story from a couple of weeks ago about a prisoner named Yasim Mohammed Basarda, who is known to have implicated 60 men or more uh, putting them at times in places they couldn't have been and he wasn't at. And then there are men like Muhammad al Qatani, the famous prisoner 063, who was just horribly tortured. This is the one that the military commission had said she wasn't going to put on trial because he'd been so badly tortured. And this is all public information from uh, Jane Mayer's The Dark Side uh, from Time Magazine's publication of the interrogation logs. 
I'd also like to mention some of the government's flawed reasoning and some of its um, examples of cultural ignorance. What I'm about to tell you actually occurred. The government will say terrorists went to Afghanistan via Pakistan, stopping at the Taliban office in Quetta. The petitioner also went to Afghanistan via Pakistan, stopping at the Taliban office in Quetta. Therefore, the prisoner is a terrorist. In, 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 in the returns for my clients, un, uh, uh, unclassified, he followed the same route. That's evidence that he's a terrorist. The prisoner stayed at a guest house in Pakistan where he says Taliban officials may have stayed. And just as an aside, the way that comes up is uh, the interrogator will say, were there Taliban at that guest house? And the prisoner will say, well, I don't know, maybe. And the way it comes out is he admits that there, he, he admits that there were Taliban there. Okay, but pull back for a second. The prisoner stayed at a guest house in Pakistan where he says Taliban officials may have stayed. This is construed as evidence that the prisoner supports, if not belongs to the Taliban, or at the very least, that the petitioner is associated with the Taliban. And under the government's capacious definition of enemy combatant, that's enough to make you an enemy combatant. Imam X studied under a teacher whose views coincide with those of Al-Qaeda. The prisoner was inspired to go to Afghanistan by a sermon given by Imam X. This is evidence that the prisoner, in going to Afghanistan, was carrying out the mission of Al-Qaeda. Those are three examples of logic that's employed. Other adverse in inferences drawn by the government reflect misplaced cultural assumptions. Isn't it suspicious, the government asks, that the prisoner was caught in Afghanistan with a large amount of cash? Well, it's not suspicious if you consider that the typical Yemeni doesn't carry debit or credit cards. The debit and credit cards don't count for much in Afghanistan because there are no ATMs out there. Isn't it suspicious, the government asks, that once in Afghanistan, the prisoner left his passport with a friend or an acquaintance? something no American would ever do. Well, it's not suspicious if you consider that Afghanistan, under the Taliban, didn't require passports or visas, and there was a real risk of theft. So in effect, you leave your passport in the hotel safe, and then you go around the country. And you have no worries because you don't need the passport. Isn't it suspicious, the government asks, that the prisoner refers to friends and acquaintances only by their given names, Abdul Salam, Muhammad, Wabdul Wahab, Ali, Ahmed. Well, it's not suspicious if you consider that Arabs in some places know each other only by their given names and that their succeeding names don't correspond to surnames with which, they're, which, which, with which we're familiar, uh, but to their, to their uh, tribal names, their village names, and so forth. When I'm with my clients and I say, can you tell me how uh, Al Hila is doing? They'll say, who's Al Hila? And I'll say, oh, Abdul Salam Al Hila. And they'll say, oh, Abdul Salam. It's just not the same thing. It's apples and oranges. Now, the prospects for release, which is where I'm going to try to close as soon as possible. Obama took office, he issued the executive orders. The executive orders didn't commit him to anything. He, he, he put them out there with, ground, with great fanfare, but if you look at them, he says, I'm going to close Guantanamo within a year. He doesn't say the men will be freed. If they're not freed by then, they'll go somewhere else. He says, we're going to halt the military commissions. He doesn't say the military commissions are no more. He's going to look at it, see whether it makes sense to change it, do it differently. He's left himself the flexibility to start it up again. A lot of us don't think he will, but he didn't wipe it off the books from scratch. He said, we're going to have an investigation of the conditions under which the men are kept, see whether it complies with Article 3, 
He sent down an admiral to review the conditions of a naval base, and guess what? Yes, we're complying with common Article III. You could anticipate that. Um, am I cynical? Yes, I am. I think that the people that Obama has appointed to the Justice Department, from my standpoint, are the good guys. I think that they mean well. I think that they are fundamentally sympathetic. Uh, and I think they want to do the right thing. However, uh, there's already been a lot of pushback from the other side, as I would call them, talking about what happens when the men go back in the field, they blow themselves up, they return to the battlefield. There are also serious practical impediments, which consist of the fact that European won't, countries won't take any of these guys unless we take some of them. And America is pretty xenophobic about this. We won't even take the guys who have been declared not to be enemy combatants. And then finally, there's the political reality that when the Obama administration looks at the Guantanamo problem, it's looking at in the context of, well, if I push this, is it going to hurt me with the stimulus package? Is it going to hurt me with health reform? So this just becomes one piece in a Rubik's cube. I wake up every morning thinking about Guantanamo. Obama wakes up with other things on his mind. So uh, the problems are very difficult going forward. I think that the Obama people are going to try to do everything they can. The first thing they can start doing is improving the conditions under which the men are kept. Thank you. And David Reams has agreed to take some questions. We have actually two of our wonderful LAPA undergraduate associate uh, LAPA undergraduate associates who are going to run microphones because if you don't talk into a microphone, no one will hear you when we're actually recording the session. So we can uh, put it up online. There's a microphone right there. So we have Kelly and Elizabeth and uh, questions right over here. Actually, Elizabeth right there. Oh, and then we'll get you next. Okay, perfect. Don. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Have you or your former firm been subjected to any uh, harassment or investigations or any kind of threats by the previous administration for your work with the Guantanamo detainees? Uh, no. I personally have been subjected to a lot of hate emails, and I even had a death threat, um, which only convinced me that I was doing the right thing. But what has been going on in Guantanamo is uh, not just indefensible, it's uncontroversially indefensible. You have every element of the bar, from blue chip firms like mine to solo practitioners financing their work out of their retirement savings, the ABA, and so on. When a government official named Cully Stimson uh, tried to whip up our corporate clients into, into firing us for our Guantanamo work, he got fired and became the subject of bar disciplinary proceedings. So there may have been some controversy at some firms at the beginning of this just because of who the men were. But as a general matter, um, we haven't suffered anything like that at all. I'll be right behind you. Uh -huh. I'm Mr. Reams. Thank you for coming here. Milt Wilkins, Class of 2009. Uh, now, even in the wake of the Boom Media decision, it still seems that the Military Commissions Act is currently still the final word on combatant uh, classification, combatant, well, detainee uh, protections, legal protections, aside from habeas corpus. And it'll still remain so whether or not detainees are still eventually brought onto U.S. soil even after Guantanamo is finally closed. So first off, do you agree with that assessment? Secondly, I guess, would be, yeah, does anything necessarily change with Guantanamo's cl uh, closure? What else do you think should be changed by this administration? And basically, do you feel that giving detainees a habeas hearing is sufficient to recognize the rights to, you, that, to which you think that they're entitled? Well, I think that going going from the last part to the first part, is it's our belief that the overwhelming uh, number of men who are there don't deserve to be held as enemy combatants. We quarrel with the government's definition of enemy combatants. The second thing I'd say is that whether or not men are released is not a function of dangerousness. It's not a function of what they're alleged to have done. 92% of the Saudis are back in Saudi Arabia. 92% of the Yemenis remain at Guantanamo. 
And the Saudis were accused of things far worse. Why? Because we like Saudi Arabia's oil. We like the alliance that we have with them on a military level. Uh, Yemen is just sort of a, an annoying flea uh, that actually is identified with al-Qaeda in many ways. We haven't struck a deal with them. All the Europeans are back. Uh, we've only had 13 out of about 117 Yemenis go back. So the habeas hearings aren't enough. We hope that they will result in declarations that the men aren't enemy combatants, but ultimately that's not what's going to set them free. The U.S. is even fighting whether the courts can release the men. Thank you for coming to talk to us tonight. Uh, very uh, briefly, can you give us your assessment uh, of what the rest of the world thinks of us with regard to uh, this, and not just in the prisoners' own home countries, but the other countries of the world that you're aware of in this context? I think that everybody was very heartened by Obama's election from that standpoint, and it does uh, signal a change in the wind. And when Obama says we don't torture, people take it a good deal more seriously than when Bush said we don't torture. One joke is that uh, uh, Bush was asked whether waterboarding is torture, and his reply was, no, because we don't torture. Um, people believe Obama, and I believe Obama more than I believe Bush, so I think it's a good thing. On the other hand, I think people are going to find that the problems are still pretty intractable of closing Guantanamo. I think what Obama did has raised the U.S.'s standing. He has a lot of goodwill out there. But now, in a sense, the ball's in the court of the European countries, and, and they're having to come face to face with their own commitment to justice. Thank you. Could you please explain which part of our Constitution is violated by allowing these detainees to be held uh, without due process in, at Guantanamo. I'm not an attorney. Well, let's start with the due process clause. <laughs> uh, the men are there. They're being held indefinitely. They haven't been charged with anything. They haven't been able to challenge the evidence on which the government says it's relying. They haven't been able to confront their accusers. Under conventional constitutional standards, that would be due process. That would be Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial. They were being held there without being allowed to bring habeas actions. That's a violation of the uh, habeas protection of the Constitution. There are even actions that are being brought under the Religious Freedom Reform Act, or I'm not sure the exact, what? Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Restoration, RIFRA. RIFRA. Uh, that, they're, that those statutory rights, which are meant to um, support the First Amendment religious freedom rights, are being violated. But your question went to detention. I, I basically say due process and uh, is, is what we now have now that habeas has been recognized. There's been no fair process by which a court has found that they're lawfully held. Elizabeth, right next to you there. Uh -huh. Hi. Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Um, you said at the beginning of your talk that you thought um, Obama's year-long timeline was too long for uh, closing Guantanamo. What do you think a reasonable timeline for um, treating the prisoners there would be like? I think that, as, as I said, the closing Guantanamo is only getting rid of a physical facility. It's the release of the men that's important, and I think that um, I think that the deadline that is given is sort of a false deadline because what it leads to is the closure of the facility. I don't know what the solution is in terms of dealing with the practical problems. You still have to send the men somewhere. I would, with respect to the Yemenis, I would just let them out of their cells, load them onto a transport jet, take them over to Yemen, land, let them out of the plane, turn around, and come back. That's basically all I think we can do as far as Yemen goes, but that's 40% of the prison population. 
That's a huge chunk. People have said, you solve the Yemeni problem, you solve the Guantanamo problem. Uh, the other thing I would do is to bring the poor Uyghurs into this country. The Uyghurs are uh, a, an ethnic minority in China who have been fighting a resistance campaign for a long time. And a federal court in the past couple of months said these men are not enemy combatants and they should all be returned home but nobody will take them so far, either because the Chinese government has been leaning on people saying, these guys are dangerous terrorists, we want them back, but the U.S. knows better than to send them back, and because the U.S. won't take them in. And Europeans are reluctant to bring any men over there if we don't make the first move, and that's completely justifiable. Why should we export our headache to other countries. Why should other countries import a headache from us? We're not even going to uh, show that we can accept or host, in, in the words of some, these men. So there are, oh, and then there are men who need to be kept because we want to try them for what I would consider to be legitimate purposes. They attacked the United States. They hit the World Trade Center. They blew up embassies. They shot soldiers. I mean, those things are, as, as far as I'm concerned, we should be able to prosecute them for that. But where do you prosecute them? Do you prosecute them in Guantanamo? Do you prosecute them in the U.S.? So there are a whole host of these practical problems. To get back to your point, what should Obama have said? I think that he should have said, we're going to bring the Uyghurs in. We're going to close camps five and six. And we're, either, and we're going to administer force feeding in a humane way. The first thing he could have done was to bring about a radical improvement in the conditions of confinement. But I fear that by saying we're going to close Guantanamo within a year, he will have left a broad impression that the problem's being solved, that you really don't have to worry about things anymore. And it takes a lot of pressure off Obama because he can create the impression of forward movement but leave himself free not to move forward, or not to move forward very quickly. Okay, Elizabeth, there's somebody in the back row, and while you're getting the microphone up to them, uh, Kelly, if you could get Sala over here. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you know what is the policy behind bringing the detainees to Europe? I mean, why does the U.S. want to dump them in Europe? Why not in Australia? I mean, they're like... <laughs> well, the U.S. The, the US would like to dump them in Australia, well, and too. And we don't let it happen. I mean, they're just discussing that. Well, I, I, I use Europe as sort of a generic reference to the West, and I think you'd include Australia in the West, even though it's in the East. <laughs> Actually, can I, can I just yeah. add one thing to that? Because one of the problems that, uh, that is going on here is that a lot of these guys are from places that if you send them back home, you're sending them back to governments that are going to torture or disappear them. So, you know, there's another problem. Once the U.S. gets over holding them, then the question is where you send them. And so I think what, what David Reams is suggesting is that some of the countries that won't torture them are among American allies, and many of the countries that we know won't torture them also won't take them. So I think that's the, that's the bigger problem, yeah? Yeah. Uh, one of my clients is an Algerian who uh, refuses to go back to Algeria because the government associates him with al-Qaeda because he deserted from the army, and al-Qaeda associates him with the government because he was an accountant with the Algerian oil monopoly. And if he goes back, he gets shot at from both sides. The U.S. wanted to send him back. He, he can't go back, but where is he going to go? Now I'll go back, yeah. So, um, my name is Bernard Haeckel. I'm a professor here at Princeton. And for purposes of full disclosure, I've worked with... Um, one prosecutor in the Hamdan case and um, with the ACLU on the KSM case and the Nashiri case for, for the defense. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One is, what do you do uh, with um, the hardened individuals who actually don't want to be tried, don't recognize American law, and just want to be executed and martyred, essentially? Um, so that's, that's the first question. And, and whether, so my, my position, just to kind of tell you about this, is that I think one should not um, sentence them to death because you would fall into the into the, the kind of martyrdom complex and of the of the movement that they belong to. The uh, 
The, the other question has to do with something that was just raised now, which is that in the case of Yemen specifically, a country I actually am an expert on, uh, you know, they, they will either be tortured, imprisoned and tortured, or the government has instrumentally used al-Qaeda members to fight its own domestic enemies and also others and exported, allowed them to export their, their violence overseas. And we know that two of the former Guantanamo inmates actually turned up in Yemen recently and a reconstituted Al-Qaeda. But so, those were Saudis. Well, I'm one just, of them was handed over to the Saudis. Right. But, right, al -Aufi. In, in any event, you know, they, they are Guantanamo inmates who actually have re-entered the ranks at a very high level of Al-Qaeda. So it is a real problem, and, and I don't really know what the answer to, to that uh, is. So I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Well, starting with the first part of the question, uh, it is kind of ironic that when uh, KSM stood up in court, he's... I had a footnote. Yeah. KSM is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's the guy who uh, confessed on Al Jazeera to have implotted 9-11. Among many other things. Among right. many, and he's since confessed to almost everything else in sight. But. So um, <laughs> he got up and he said, thank you. I've been waiting for this moment all my life. You are about to martyr me. I welcome it. And a couple of the other defendants said that too. One defendant, who's the brother of another client of mine, uh, Wally Benatosh, said uh, to the judge in a sort of baiting way, your Honor, would you just answer one question for me? After you execute me, am I going to be buried in Guantanamo or in Saudi Arabia? So, you know, first of all, I don't believe in the death penalty. So they're not going to get martyred that way. And second of all, I think the best way to martyr them is to give them the death penalty. If you find that somebody's guilty of the crime, put them away like Musawi. He's not going to die physically, but he will die psychologically and mentally, and maybe that's cruel and inhumane itself, and that's another question. I don't want to prove it so lightly, but to me, the death penalty isn't an issue anyway. Do you want to take the second? Oh, the, the, the return to the battlefield question? The return question? to the battlefield question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, to the extent that there's been a return to the battlefield, all I can say is that it's been in a very tiny number of cases. If you even think that going to al-Qaeda where the purpose or function of it is to, is as part of the internal politics of Yemen, uh, it's really hard to know whether somebody will or somebody won't. I do have to go back to my point that dangerous is, dangerousness has never been a consideration in whether a person's released or not. We end up in this abstract debate. There are three categories of men. Those who are innocent and should be released. Those who are uh, accused of serious crimes and should be tried. And then the middle category of sort of indeterminate men. We can't quite try them, but we can't quite release them. That makes logical sense. It's a beautiful construct. But I don't know who's in this middle category. I don't know how we can tell they're in the middle category. And besides, it's never been a relevant consideration in release. So I think it's sort of an abstract question. It's also something we can't predict. The guy who went back to Kuwait, who two years later went and became a suicide bomber in Iraq, uh, I don't know that anybody could have foreseen that. You know the Washington Post article said, well, this was a guy who was very bitter at the United States. But he didn't go attack the United States. He went to take a side in a struggle in Iraq, and he committed an act of terrorism in Iraq. Two years later, after he was released from Guantanamo, are we going to require these men to wear ankle bracelets for the rest of their lives? I just don't know how you can anticipate it or control it. Uh, actually, uh, Sam down here. I know that there's been a lot of perception in the U.S. media that if you close Guantanamo, you kind of fix the problem. Are you concerned that, <coughs> sorry, that by closing Guantanamo, you actually end up with these men in prisons abroad that are technically not under U.S. control, but will be out of kind of your reach as a U.S. attorney, will be kind of farther out there and just left in those prisons as opposed to 
being put back in the U.S. system, which I think is kind of the assumption of where they would end up? Well, that's a very excellent question because that's really where the next battle is going to be. Ever since the Supreme Court ruled in, in 2004 that the men are entitled to have lawyers, the flow of men into Guantanamo essentially stopped, except for the high-value detainees who were brought in 2006 and a couple of others. Instead, the U.S. started moving men into the prisons we have in Bagram. And a, a lot of our concern is that Guantanamo will fade away, but then we'll have the problem of Bagram, where, as you say, it's much more difficult for lawyers and courts to have access. And one of the disappointing things about the Obama administration so far is that they embrace the Bush administration's view that Bagram is beyond the reach, excuse me, of the American courts. Um, then there's also the fear that, they w that we will send them to uh, be held in proxy detention by other countries. That's also a fear they'll be in our constructive custody, even though they're not in our actual custody. So those are two very great concerns, and it really is going to be the next front in the uh, legal battle. Actually, if I can just add one thing. Bagram is this U.S. Air Force base in Afghanistan, and I believe now they're holding 5,000 or 6,000 detainees. I mean, Guantanamo has got 245 right now. And basically all the detainees that the U.S. has picked up around the world in the last several years have all been sent to Afghanistan, um, as David said, ever since it was clear that Guantanamo was going to be under the jurisdiction of U.S. courts. So that's another issue that we haven't even dealt with that Obama hasn't talked the about The numbers yet. are a little bit squirrely because who's held by the Afghanis and who's held by the U.S. are uh, hard, it's hard to untangle, but there's one facility that we have that holds 600 prisoners, and construction is underway to double the capacity. Hi. Um, so I guess my question is somewhat similar to his, just the fact that I just, it's kind of confusing of who, I mean, who determines who has original jurisdiction over these people is were my questions. And my other question is, is you spoke briefly about that gentleman that was actually convicted and released. Can you, I mean, why, why was that? Can you go into more detail about that? Well, yeah, the answer to the first question is that there is debate uh, in the human rights, the international human rights community about when it, uh, when the government can legitimately hold a person beyond the review of the courts and without any kind of process. And the classic example of that is the battlefield capture, uh, where you have the army tent, the army, the, 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 soul, the officers in the army tent who decide this guy really is a, a combatant and not a shepherd and we're going to hold him. I don't think anybody thinks that those battlefield capture situations are ones that the courts can or should get into. But when the U.S. starts warehousing prisoners in prison-type facilities on an indefinite basis without charge, uh, I think that that's where courts begin to have a role. And in the case of the Bagram prison, you have lots of men there who were arrested in far-flung places, Bangkok and elsewhere, who were then brought there to be in Bagram, and you tell me what's the functional difference between that and Guantanamo. Okay, so that's the first thing. With respect to Salim Hamdan, he had been, he was, he was Osama's chauffeur. I'm sorry. He was Osama bin Laden's chauffeur, his driver. And he was one of the first to be uh, charged with a war crime, what we defined as a war crime for purposes of the military commission trials. To cut to the chase, he ended up being tried on a conspiracy charge that could have had, um, that could have put him away for life and the material assistance for ter a terrorism charge, which was a lesser offense. The military jury, in an act of uh, courage and conscientiousness, acquitted him of the conspiracy charge. I mean, this is just a guy who 
was driving, and they said that because Osama was in the back seat, he was part of the driver was part of the conspiracy, and uh, he was convicted of, mater of material support for terrorism because he was driving Obama. So the uh, the National sorry. Criminal Osama, <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, the National Criminal uh, Defense Lawyers Association said that. Uh, that Salim had been, that a truck driver had been convicted of being a truck driver. Anyhow, the military jury gave him a sentence, but then credit for time served. So he only had about four months left on his sentence. His sentence was due to be completed in December, uh, and the government actually released him a month before his sentence expired to be kept in Yemen for the remaining month. And the government actually said, you know, even after he finishes his sentence, we can continue to hold him indefinitely because he's still an enemy combatant. And, but that turned out to be, because enemy combatant is a status. It's not an, it's not an offense in the formal sense of the word, although I would consider it to be treated like an offense. So, the government said we could actually keep him, but it would have been so embarrassing politically and diplomatically. It would have made the military commission process look like such a fraud to have a man finish his sentence and then continue to hold him. So the U.S. found some way of prevailing on the Yemen government, maybe $30 million in military aid or something, and Yemen took him back. And then when he was finished with his sentence, he went free. So I'm curious if you, you and your team have a relationship with uh, either Reprieve or with the sympathetic Jags. The answer to both questions is yes. One of the uh, uh, unique selling points of my uh, nonprofit organization is to serve as U.S. counsel for Reprieve. Uh, in, uh, I think it'll probably be more to go forward because they can't keep sending their lawyers from London over to the U.S. It's expensive and time-consuming. So in the Algerian case, they called me up. I went into court and got an order blocking the release of the man, men. So I anticipate working very closely with them. They are just absolutely terrific human rights lawyers. With respect to the JAGs, um, a couple of the habeas lawyers have also been civilian defense counsel in the military commissions, but that's essentially the only really formal connection. The other connections are we're all part of the brotherhood of representing the prisoners, and we all uh, talk to each other and try to help each other and support each other. Another question? Over here. Yeah. Hi. Is there a practical, humane alternative to force feeding by chewing? And if so, is there any decent reason why? Could you repeat the yeah, question, can, please? Is there a practical, humane alternative to force feeding by chewing? And if so, is there a good reason why it hasn't been implemented? And if not, what's the, what's the alternative? I'm not a medical uh, expert. You know, I would have thought the way to, to force feed some is someone is a tube down his throat or an intravenous uh, line, but I really, that really goes beyond my expertise. Uh, thank you for coming here to talk with us. Um, based on your first-hand experience in Guantanamo Bay, uh, I was wondering to what extent do you think <clears throat> we have extracted useful information from the detainees and if the government and uh, military recognize the ineffectiveness of torture and detention, why has Guantanamo Bay uh, remained open for such a long time? Are the well, so-called Rumsfeldians inherently immoral beings, or do they seriously um, like thought there was genuine um, political ne necessity at the time to implement these measures? Your question presupposes that there was intelligence to be gotten out of the detainees. And I don't know the extent to which there was. I did, you know, to the extent that you posit, as I do, that most of the men were picked up 
because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, or that many of the men were. I'd say there was no intelligence to extract in the first place. With respect to the men who might legitimately have fallen into our overbroad definition of enemy combatants, they tended to be what, you know, the, the foot soldiers, the guy who was on the defensive line uh, with the Taliban when the Northern Front was moving forward holding a rifle. What kind of intelligence are you going to extract from that kind of guy? You really want to know, I think, about the structure of al-Qaeda, the planning, the organization, and the like. And I think that mainly the people who have that knowledge are people who are being put on trial for crimes. Now, of course, as Rumsfeld said, I don't know what I don't know. But you need to be uh, cautious when you make generalizations like, do you think they've gotten all the information out of the detainees they could get? Because you just, again, can't make this general assumption that all the detainees had intelligence to get. And I know you weren't necessarily implying that. With respect to uh, the question, does the government think the torture is ineffective? Uh, the government long played word games about what constitutes torture. For one thing, the, I think the administration has said that from now on it's going to adhere to the Army field manuals, uh, rules for interrogating prisoners, which I think is much more humane than the methods that Rumsfeld approved. I think there's still some controversy. I see this every once in a while on list serves about whether there are worrisome loopholes. And I also understand, and this is just, I don't know where I read this, and it may be false, that Eric Holder has said all, you know, all of the torture memos are inoperative for the moment. Um, there was a last part of your question. What was it? Do you remember? <laughs> I was just wondering, um, like, are these government administrators? Well, that's not a very good question. Um, do you think at the time they believed that there was political necessity to implement these measures, or they did it for, I don't know, <laughs> personal reasons, um, like irrational reasons? I think, I, think, I, I think the whole thing was part of a much larger project on the part of the administration to demonstrate that the executive branch could do whatever it wanted to do without having to account to anyone. So I think that that was part of it. I also think that the administration was beholden, beholden implies passivity, so I'll use another word. They embraced the idea that this was a war because that allowed the uh, executive to assert these very broad powers. Third, you have this assumption on the part of Cheney, Rumsfeld, and everybody on down that the people who had been apprehended really were all vicious rats who'd gnaw their way through that hydraulic cable. And fourth, uh, you know, I think there was just a lot of Jack Bauer mentality, that if you just torture a guy long enough, you'll get what you want out of him. There's a whole ticking time bomb mentality. So I think they believed that what they were doing would get them where they wanted to go. I think they ignored the fact that it was criminal, what they were doing. They ignored the advice of experts who said that it wouldn't be productive. And so much suffering resulted from those things. Uh, one more question over here. Almost. Hmm. When I was in Washington a few uh, years ago at a protest, I ha we just happened to meet one of the lawyers uh, who said that there were some 300 lawyers in the Washington area, and I think around the country now working on this. And I just heard you use the word drug in the beginning to sound like a disclaimer um, I said the of contact with, right. other, with other lawyers. My question is, We've talked about what do others think of us. I'm wondering what effect Guantanamo is having on our, the American public. 
public's sense of justice in this country and what you and you said you wake up thinking about Guantanamo and so do I and I'm sure there are others. What effect is this having on other lawyers in this country, on our state of our of justice in this country? Well, as for the Brotherhood thing, if, if you were referring to my disclaimer at the beginning that I wasn't pretending to speak for anybody and no one authorized me, it's because I'm not. I mean, nobody sent me here. Kim brought me here, and I'm just one person, and uh, I don't want to bind everybody else or even pretend to bind everybody else to what I'm saying. On the second part of your question, I have very um, uh, uncertain feelings about the effect of Guantanamo on Americans' perception of justice because it seems to me that everybody says, or, or many, most people say, that Guantanamo was a mistake, that it's a blot on our reputation, that it was shameful, that it was unjust, and on and on and on. On the other hand, only a bare majority of people in one poll say that Guantanamo should be closed, and in another poll, only 29% of the public said that Guantanamo should be closed. And we kind of joked among ourselves that the habeas lawyers constitute that 29%. <laughs> um, and when you get past the abstract question of justice and fairness and torture as a principle, I still maintain that very few people see the men there as human beings who are suffering as human beings, have very little sympathy for them, if any, because they have been so brainwashed and were receptive by the background racism of the American public, unfortunately. So you have this uh, you know, sort of Charlie Brown situation where he's in love with humanity. It's the people he can't stand. Well, here people say the legal principles are all right and Guantanamo is bad because it violated that. But you know, the enthusiasm for relieving these men of their suffering and doing right by them, I don't think it's there. Slightly depressing note, but we've actually reached the end of our normal time limit. But I think that one of the things that you see is the extraordinary dedication it takes to keep these cases in the public eye. And I'm really grateful to all of you for coming to listen to this tonight. And we should all be grateful to David Reams, both for what he's doing and for what he said to us.